Um, I don't believe it is a coincidence that, that there is a movie out there now called Noah. Uh, I don't believe that we should be receiving our information from what Hollywood and producers say about Noah. I recommend that you do not go see the movie Noah only because I have good friends that have told me it's a piece of trash. It's a horrible movie. It's a movie that totally distorts the biblical account of a godly man moving in the fear of God. Instead of depicting a God-fearing prophet that prepares for the salvation of his family, uh, they, they depict this Noah as a homicidal maniac trying to kill his family. One man said they should have named this movie The Babylonian Chainsaw Massacre. A crazy rendition of what Hollywood purports to retell a timeless truth. I propose that our lives are not in line uh, with this movie to go see it and even spend money or even your time. It would be uh, better that you would see the opportunity to sit down with your family and read chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 of Genesis and, and invest your time in those efforts so that your sons and your daughters and your grandsons are not being told biblical truth through perverted, distorted atheists who have put this movie together. But I want to say that while Christians all over the place are ragging on this movie and they're saying it doesn't uh, comport to the biblical parameters, I want to say that our modern day Christianity does not either. So the people that are angry about this movie being a distortion of the biblical account, I want to suggest that our lives are a distortion of the order God wants to place in our lives. And, and instead of being real Christians who have surrendered all, you guys know what surrender all was, it's just saying, I'm not going to do my affairs, because if you, if you take your rendition of your life as a Christian, and what God is calling to uh, us to live as a Christian, there's a great distortion, and we could call this the Babylonian Chainsaw Massacre. We have massacred and we have distorted God's truth and we have no longer conformed to God's order. It's called the dissipation, the flood of dissipation. Everybody's doing Christianity the way they want and that's a travesty. And I purport this morning and I brought a small clip we're going to see so that you can see how weird America has become in their uh, considering who God is and what God wants and what their lives are and I don't care and I'm going to do my own thing only to check ourselves with respect to our surrender in God. Let's go ahead and watch this very quickly. There's a man named Noah, like in the Bible? Right now. Well, the Bible Noah? No, I do not believe he existed. So you don't think he built an ark? No, no. I'm very comfortable with my atheism, but I support myths. You think God sent a flood and drowned the whole world? No. <laughs> you don't? No. If he had, would it have been fair to do so? Oh, uh, no. Why would he do that? Uh, well, the Bible says because the heart of man was corrupt, his imaginations were continually evil, and there was great wickedness and violence on the earth. Do you think that's justification for wiping out the whole of humanity, except for Noah and his family? No. Noah, born over 2,700 years BC, was a shipbuilder and a prophet of the century. Many think of Noah and the ark as a story from the past, but did you know that according to Jesus, the events surrounding the life of Noah are directly related to you? Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, the things that happened in Noah's day will be similar to the things that are going to happen during the time referred to in the Bible as the end of the age. In a moment, you're going to see clearly that the end of the age is happening now. But of all the signs, the one prevalent thing that happened in Noah's day was that people who knew right from wrong chose to ignore Noah's warning of God's coming judgment, such as the way of the 21st century. 
Do you think there was a man named Noah like in the Bible? I did for a long time. I don't right now. Uh, I believe there was a man named Noah. Do you think he built an ark? I'm pretty sure that that's kind of a story. Do you think there was a man named Noah like in the Bible? Ah, there's lots of great stories about it. Do you believe there was a, a man named Noah? Um, I believe at one time there was very likely a man named Noah, whether or not he was a biblical figure and swallowed by a whale. I, I find it statistically difficult to believe that nobody's been swallowed by a whale before, so. It's a lot of animals and a little large. I mean, you're looking at over a million species out there. I don't find it possible. The boat would have to be like the size of the moon. The scriptures call Noah a preacher of righteousness. His life was prophetic in that the ark was a type of the then coming Christ. And we, like Noah, are preachers of righteousness, warning every man, calling a corrupt world to repentance and faith in Jesus, and telling them to be ready for his coming, of which no man knows the hour nor the day. Do you think we're living in the last days? No. No, I don't think so. People said we were going to die in 2012, and we didn't. I believe the whole world is going to come to an end real quickly here. I honestly couldn't care less about when the last days are coming. It'd be nice if the world ended. It's not my concern whether it's tomorrow or a million years from now. Do you know what the signs are of the end of the world? Uh, I know some of them. Tell me, what are they? Chaos. Okay, I'll take that back. Nope, don't care. Some dude in a horse chariot with like a spear, like going down from the heavens. Weather changes. We got wars and rumors of wars. Definitely the last days. The economy's going crazy. I know there's still bad things happening, but I don't think it's enough for the last days to occur. It's very dark right now. Here are 10 major biblical signs for which we are to look. The scriptures tell us there'll be money hungry Bible teachers who would slur the Christian faith and deceive many. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Yeah, name it and claim it, health and wealth. You got it right, baby. You got it right. Lord, let this anointing and power flow through our sister now. I want you to know something. I am a prophet of God. I'll never be broke another day in my life. <laughs> Say it again. I want you to make me a cake today. A hundred dollars. What happened to the pain? It's gone. Just shake off that worry. Shake off that sickness. A vow of faith has got to take faith. That's why I say a thousand dollars. People like those um, TV ministries and stuff, they're raking in lots of money. They're driving around in nice fancy cars. They're just bilking people. Taking money from people who follow blindly and profiting from it is something I think is bad. What's the root of all evil? What would you say, Belinda? Money. Money. Think it's money? It's money. Do you think the Bible says that? It does. It doesn't. The love of money. That's right. It's the love of money. It's greed, this root of all evil. Yes, sir. See, Bob, I can't send a hundred dollars. If you can just worship God through five dollars or ten dollars, every apostle Paul said the first of each week lay aside as God had prospered you. That's why I believe God prospers people. Satan gave me this mess. I mean, it's a lie of the devil. I shouldn't have said that. The second sign we're looking at is found in Matthew chapter 24. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Birthing pains, earthquakes. Giant locusts. Floods, hurricanes. So you're thinking we could be living in what the Bible could be? Yeah. So do you think this should be a judgment day? No. What about hell? I don't believe in hell. Sign number three, the moon will become blood red. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. I'm a skeptic, so, you know, I like to believe, but I'm also a skeptic that believes also. So um, it could, I mean, you always see the moon change in different colors, obviously. Uh, it, it could turn to red. In just over an hour, the full moon will turn a deep red for most of the planet. <laughs> Actually, I've seen the, the moon turn red before, and it has worried me. I was like, you know, what is this? What does it mean? Freak you out? It did freak me out. How would you react if you saw the moon was red, blood red t tonight? I would be worried. You'd be worried? Yes, I would. Why? Uh, well, I, in my physical condition, I would think, well, goodness gracious, there's something wrong. Um, I think I need to run and hide and get underneath a rock. You may remember about 10 or so years ago, this little girl named Jessica in Florida was abducted by a man. She was seven years old, cute little thing. He sexually molested her and then buried her alive in a plastic bag. They found her clutching to her teddy bear. If you were the judge, 
How would you sentence that man? Oh, I would probably, I would probably sentence him to uh, castration and, yeah, death. <laughs> Well, that, so you feel strongly about that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so why do you feel like that? Um, well, that's just, that's like the purest form of evil, what do you think? So in other words, you believe in justice? Um, yeah, I guess so. But I don't believe that we have the right to judge and... You just made a judgment. You just made a judgment on an evil act, and I think it was good. It shows you value human life, and you care about that little girl. Judgment. I'm not without judgment. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that if, if that's true, if you think such evil should be punished so severely, how much more should God punish a murderer or a rapist? Can you see that? Mm. And God's judgment is a place called hell. That's his, that's his prison, and there's no parole. It's eternal. In the last days, blasphemy will become commonplace. Do you go to R-rated movies? Of course. It's the only kind of movies I watch. Have you been to R-rated movies? I've been to X-rated movies. Have you noticed how they use the name of Jesus in blasphemy in movies? Of course. Why don't they use the name of Muhammad in a movie to cuss? Oh, wow. I, don't, I don't talk about religion over interviews. Can you think of anyone in history, a famous person like Napoleon or Shakespeare or Hitler, who had their name used as a cuss word? Can you think of anyone? Not at this moment, no. Only Jesus Christ. Why would they use his name as a cuss word? I don't know. It's a really good question, because I, I, I am guilty of that myself. Martin Scorsese's award-winning movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, received unusual international publicity. The feature film starring Leonardo DiCaprio broke the world record for its liberal use of expletives. The F word was used an average of every 21 seconds, 506 times. The S word, 70 times. God's name was blasphemed 28 times. Do you think Muslims would allow Hollywood to use their prophet's name as a cuss word? No. They respect their prophet and they expect people to. And yet we pay Hollywood to blaspheme the name of Jesus. Agreed. Another sign of the end of the age is an increase in acceptance of homosexuality, as there was in the days of Sodom. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I noticed when I came up, you two were kissing in public. You are obviously gay. Uh, do you often do that in public? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, why wouldn't we? I mean, straight people do it. Everybody does it. If you're in love, you're in love. Nothing wrong with being gay? Uh... Nah, I mean, you know, as long as they don't push it on other people, you know, people have the choice to, you know, do what they want. In the last days, religious hypocrisy will be prevalent. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. When did you last read your Bibles? This morning. Yeah, uh, yeah, this morning at church. You're born again? Yes. Are you a Christian? Yes, sir. Have you been born again? Yes, sir. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am a Christian. Yes, I am Christian. You love the Lord? Yes, sir. Did you go to R-rated movies? Um, yes, sir. No, I watch them at home. Yes, I do. What about you? Yeah. And you're a Christian? Yes. What about the sex scenes? Does that worry you? Sure. So you shouldn't go to them? Doesn't mean that we shouldn't go. You guys watch couples make love on movie screens in R-rated movies? Where do well, you don't just go to your ending point on this one? <laughs> of course you watch it. Anybody's going to watch it. What about you? How do you handle the sex scenes? I, I watch them, but... You know. Do they bother you? No. You stay for the sex scene? Well, it's always there, so, like, it's uncomfortable at points. You look the other way, or do you watch? No, I do watch. Uh, I, I mean, I look, I don't look the other way, but, yeah. This is a little bit personal, but stay with me. A husband and wife are making love in their bedroom, and they notice the curtains pulled back on the bedroom window, and there's a guy peering through the window at them, having sex. What should they do? Um, call the police. <laughs> call the cops. I would tell my wife, girlfriend, or whoever she is at the time to call. Girlfriend? Yes. Making love on the bed? Your girlfriend? You mean wife? Well, wife, you know. No, wife. Well, wife. Well, uh, outside of sex unless you're married. Yes. You should know, it's in the Bible. You should know this. I know that. <laughs> so you having sex outside of marriage? He is. He is? You guys having sex? Yes. <laughs> so you're Christians? Yes. yes. Have you had sex before marriage? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been married yet, and, you know, I've said tons of it. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I am a Christian, actually. If you're a Christian, 
You shouldn't support dirty movies. You shouldn't support movies that have blasphemy in them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Hollywood's nothing but a glorified pimp who provides clientele for America, actors who'll take their clothes off and prostitute themselves for money. Do you think I'm right? Yeah, that's true. Actually, when you put it that way, yeah. yeah. Watching people have sex. Yes. You look at a big window called a screen, he looks through a real window, but what's the difference between you and the guy who's peering through the window? You're trying to justify watching dirty movies, is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Bottom line, you shouldn't be doing that, but I do it anyway. What's the difference between you looking through a window we call a screen and the guy looking through the window at people? The same thing. <laughs> what's the difference between you and him? I guess nothing. Yeah, there is. You're paying for yours. Should a Christian support and pay Hollywood to do that? We sit. You're paying them to do so. No, I pirate all my stuff. <laughs> steal it? No, thou shalt not steal. What do you mean, pirate? I don't pay for it. Isn't that stealing? Pirating? Yes. Do you ever ask what God thinks as you sit in there and watch couples make love? No. Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. That's how high God's standards are. Am I making you think? Yeah, you are. What about you? Are you going to keep going to dirty movies and call yourself a Christian? No. So you're going to go to dirty movies from now on? Depends if the movie's good, I'll go watch it. I'm going to go to church right now, so <laughs> I definitely repent again. Are you going to keep going to dirty movies as a Christian? Oh, no. So, no. Not after that. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm like talking about your salvation. You don't want to play the hypocrite. Yeah. Does this make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it makes sense. After this talk, I see the point, you know, it really, I have to step it up in my faith and what I believe in, and I should really stop. The Bible claims that in the last days, people will deny that God created the heavens and that he judged the world through Noah's flood. Okay, so you're an atheist, so you believe that nothing created everything, which is scientifically impossible. Well, I believe that we came from a black hole, yes. Do you believe there was a worldwide catastrophic flood? No, I do not. 70% of the earth is covered in water. Yes. Where did it come from? That's a good question. That's, do you know? I have no clue at all. How did the uh, water come here? You mean from the original earth when it was formed? Well, they, 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 the scientists uh, projected it possibly from um, comets. What's your credentials? Uh, I'm a professor of geology and oceanography at Cal State University, Long Beach. Um, Rick, where do oceans come from? Well, the oceans are constantly changing, but originally the water on the Earth came from a couple different sources. One is that the materials that accumulated in the very early stages of the Earth, sort of as meteorites and asteroid bombardments, had water in them, and as they heated up, they melted, they gave off gases and water vapor, and that condensed to form a lot of water in the Earth. But another way that they came in is that a lot of the stuff that came and accumulated in the, um, in the uh, planet to form the Earth was, were comets, and comets are made up largely of water ice and methane ice. So comets bombarded the Earth, and all the water came from comets? Um, a lot of the water came from comets. Uh, is that just a theory, or is it a fact, well-known fact? Well, it's nothing about the origin of the Earth as a fact. <laughs> it was long, long, long time ago. You're a, a science teacher. Yes. Do you think comets brought water to the Earth? <laughs> No? No. Here's a question. Where did all the fish come from? There are 28,000 different species of fish, and then there's whales and dolphins and, uh, and uh, all these different sorts of fish. Do they come on the comets? That's a silly question. Where did they come from? I don't understand what a silly question that is. Well, the oceans is... What, you, you're talking, you, th you think that animals are riding in on comets through the vacuum of space? No, no, I don't, I don't, question. I don't believe that, but where did all the fish come from? There are 28,000 different species of fish in the oceans. Do you have any I'm doing it now, I'm coming to experts. That's, um, you need to do your homework before you talk to experts. I have. Well, nobody knows exactly how and when life started on Earth, but it's entirely possible that the early prebiotic material, or even the first microbes, traveled to Earth aboard a, a rock of some kind and seeded the once barren ground with what would later become every species alive today. Okay, well, thank you for talking to me. The world is covered with water. Water doesn't dissipate. 
you know, that, that's, that's what nature says. If evaporates, comes down. Evaporates, comes down. Always stays the same. So if there's a worldwide flood, water should still be hanging around somewhere. Do you think 70% of the earth being covered in water is a good clue that there was a worldwide flood? Oh, whoa. Well, he makes a good point. That's an excellent point, actually. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, it's clear. I, I mean, I have a raging clue that possibly that that's an excellent point. Maybe it is a, a, a realization that the existence of a clue of a flood. Water. We can't live without it. Neither can dogs, frogs, cats, bats, rats, or gnats, or trees, or fleas, or bees, nor can the horse, of course. We swim in it, we wash in it, we play in it, and for fish, they'll die if they don't stay in it. We clean with it and we cook in it. It's in our tea, our coffee, and our milk, in our tears, in our blood, and in our mouth. Water is the perfect combination of oxygen and hydrogen. Together, they make thirst-quenching and life-giving water. So. Where did it all come from? The Smithsonian Magazine says, water is so vital to our survival, but strangely enough, we don't know the first thing about it. Literally the first. Where does water, a giver and taker of life on planet Earth, come from? Think about it. There's no possible way in which like, they were able to fit every species of animals on Earth into that boat. Completely impossible to have two of every species on a boat. It's impossible. It does seem impossible. When it comes to Noah and his ark, two relevant questions arise. How many animals did it carry? And how large was the ark? See if you can spot the repetition of a particular word that skeptics dislike. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Genesis 6:20. That's right, it's the dreaded word kind, that archaic word that the dictionary defines as a class or group of individual objects, people, animals, etc., of the same nature or character or classified together because they have traits in common. It's a despised word because it means that God didn't have to get today's approximately 6.5 million species to fit into the ark. It means Noah needed only one pair for the canine kind, from which would come all the species of dog, from the Chihuahua to the Great Dane, and one pair for the feline kind, from which would come the domesticated cat and the tiger, etc. So now we're talking just thousands of animals, not millions. And because these animals need not have been fully grown, averaging the size of a sheep, it becomes possible. Another consideration is the size of the ark. It wasn't a little rubber ducky bobbing boat portrayed in kids' cartoons. It was a massive three-level ship the size of one and a half football fields. Another argument skeptics have against the worldwide flood is that there's not enough water on the earth to cover the highest mountains. They forget that mountains were not the height they are now, and that the earth and the sky store trillions of tons of water. The Bible says that the flood waters came from both the sky and the earth. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Genesis 7:11. The end of the age will be marked by fear of the future. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Are you fearful of the future? Oh, of course. Are you fearful of the future? Yes. The planet's only getting worse and worse, to be honest. I mean, I see it happen day by day. And... Are you fearful of the future for humanity? Definitely. <laughs> Are you afraid of the future? Terrified. In the last days, scoffers will mock the second coming by claiming that these signs have always been around. Where is the promise of his coming? I can't say that we're living at the end of the age because that's, that's been talked about for so many years. They've been saying that for uh, I don't know how many years. All that stuff's been going on all along. These signs have always been around. People interpret things the way that they would like to. Do you think we're seeing those in today's society? I think we're not only seeing it in today's society, I think we've been seeing it since society began. We live in a world as Noah did, where people are ignoring the warning of the gospel. They're eating, drinking, marrying, and given in marriage. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be? What do you please think about this, or are you got a closed mind? Uh, no, the thing is, I don't think that those things are all that serious. And, you know, if God thinks they're serious, you know, so be it. Have I embarrassed you at all? No, no, I'm not embarrassed. Okay, I well, just... I appreciate you listening. <laughs> what I'm going to do is change gears a little. Oh, 
over. Can, can you, you handle it? I can handle changing gears, yes. Are you a good person, like ethically? Yeah, morally. I like to think so. I think so. What about you? I've done some stuff, but I think I have a good thing going on with the big man up top. How many lies have you told in your life? Thousands. What about you? A lot. I've told a lot of lies. Oh, <laughs> I have no idea. You just blasphemed God's name. Sorry. You just broke the third commandment. We haven't even got there yet. What are you? A liar. You have stolen something. Yeah. What do you call someone who steals things? A thief. What are you? I'm evidently a thief and a liar. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Oh, yes. All the time. More than 10 times a day. I'm not judging you guys. No, wait a second. But by your own admission, you're lying thieves, blasphemers, and adulterers at heart. <laughs> I can enjoy my life however the f I decide to, and that's what I choose to do. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah, that's one of my favorite phrases, and I always use it. It's called blasphemy to use God's name as a cuss word. It's very serious in his eyes. I don't think this will help either. What's that? I don't think that will help anymore either. That's a uh, sign of the devil. <laughs> well, I've done all the things that God tells me not to do. So I'm not judging you guys, but by your own admission, you both said you're lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterous at heart. And you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, you're going to be innocent or guilty. Oh, dude, I broke like nine of ten. Yeah, and what about you? I plead the fifth. Are you going to be innocent or guilty? Uh, very likely guilty. Heaven or hell? I suppose hell. Hell is where I will go. Would you go to heaven or hell? I don't know, as far away from your God as possible. You're not a good person. You're like the rest of us. You're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart, by your own admission. I mean, I'd obviously be guilty unless he's, unless he's the worst judicial system I've ever seen. So what can you do to justify yourself, Chris? How can you escape the damnation of hell? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to that question. I believe that God is so loving. I don't believe he would send someone to hell. So Hitler's got a little mansion in heaven. Six million Jews, men, women, and children mean nothing to God. So you believe in justice because you're made in the image of God. You're not like an animal, a cat, or a dog. Dogs don't care about justice and truth and retribution. Each year we spend trillions of dollars worldwide to see that justice is done. And that's because we're unique in creation. We're moral beings made in the image of God. Would you agree with that? Mm, yeah. I believe that the good I've done outweighs the bad I've done. Try that in a court of law. It doesn't work. If you've raped a woman and say, Judge, I give money to charities, he's not even going to take that into account. He's only going to take your crime into account. It's exactly the same with God. doesn't matter how much good you do, it's not going to wash away your sins. Man, we're talking about your eternal salvation. Where are you going to spend eternity? You're like a little kid who's holding a stick of dynamite, and it's sparkling, and he loves the sparkle. And I'm saying, toss it from you, toss it from you. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says, the soul that sins that shall die, the thing that you delight in, your sins, is going to be the death of you, your most precious life. Does that concern you? Uh, a little bit. That's why I've been going to church. Uh, you know, if you saw me on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up, and I was wearing a parachute that was really loose, I'm sure you'd tell me. Absolutely. Nathan, I'm telling you today, this is, your salvation is loose. You've got to tighten things. I agree. There is one God. He's morally perfect and holy and just, and he's going to judge the world in righteousness on the day of judgment, and you and I both need a savior, someone who can wash away our sins. Now, do you know what God did for guilty sinners so they wouldn't have to go to hell? He gave his only begotten son, right? You need God's forgiveness, and God offers it through what Jesus did on the cross. Do you understand the legal implications of that? The legal implications? No, explain them. Well, the Bible says God is a judge. He's perfect and holy. You and I are criminals. We're sinners. We've violated his law, the Ten Commandments. We're heading for a place called hell, God's prison, without parole. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus stepped in and paid our fine in full. You and I broke God's law. Jesus paid our fine. That means God can legally dismiss your case. He can commute your death sentence and let you live forever because your fine was paid by another. You know, if you're in a court of law and you're guilty and someone pays your fine, the judge will say, Fine's paid, you're out of here. And that's what God can say of your crimes against his law. He can forgive you and he can let you live because of the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Each of us have sinned, but the moment we come to Christ and are born again, God clothes us in what he calls righteousness so that he no longer sees our sins. That means he doesn't have to punish us with hell. He can grant us immortality. But what you have to do is repent of your sins. Don't confess them to a priest. Confess them and forsake them. That is, don't play the hypocrite and put your trust in Jesus Christ. The moment you do that, God will remit your sins, grant you everlasting life, and he'll give you a new heart with new desires so you long to do the things that please him and not the things of your own sinful desires. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah it does, actually. 
Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Now we're making sense. I like that now we're making I sense. Like that. that was excellent. I do like that. Makes sense what you're saying. That that ending just that was that, that, was, that was like yeah. the that was like the catalyst to like real talk. That was the clicking point. Hey, you gonna think about this? I'm sure I will. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I understand what you're saying, but but that's not it's not for me. Okay, I know that. Uh, that's why I'm talking to you. It took a lot for, for you to come here and talk to me and other people here. So, yeah, I'll think about it. I'm not going to lie, you, you, blew, you blew my brain, which is not in a, in a weird way, but, huh? Could you, say, could you explain what you mean by that? You, you, you made real? you got to repent and trust in Christ. When are you going to do that? I, don't, I can't an honestly answer that question. I don't know. Well, I can help you out. I'd say do it today. I mean, if you die in your sins. I might. There's two things you have to do to be saved. You've got to repent and trust alone in Jesus. When are you going to do that? Maybe tomorrow on church. Well, you don't have to wait till tomorrow because it may not come. You could die tonight in your sleep. We're talking serious stuff. And you don't have to do it in church. God dwells everywhere, just in the quietness of your heart. Say, God, please forgive my sins. Be truly contrite or sorry for your sins. And put your faith in Jesus like you trust a parachute. You know, when you jump out of a plane and trust a parachute, you don't trust your own arms. You don't try and fly. You only trust the parachute. And the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust alone in Him. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You don't know when you're going to die. 150,000 people die every 24 hours, and I'm saying there is a sense of urgency here. W would, you be, would you be embarrassed if I pray with you? No, no. While respected Bible scholars may disagree on the timing of some of these signs, they all agree on one thing, that Jesus Christ is coming again. We didn't produce Noah to entertain you. We produced it in the sincere hope that you'd obey the gospel that you repent of your sins and trust alone in Jesus Christ. So that we'll see you in heaven. For those of you that want to share this with your families at another time, you can look this up on YouTube and it is Ray Comfort and his full movie called Noah. And he says, it's better that your families would see this than the garbage that's in the movie theater. Amen? And as for us, as for us that sit in the house of God, I believe God is being faithful. Matthew chapter 24, 37 says, as in the days of Noah. That is the importance of what is going on in our day. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I'm a pastor and I've been a Christian for 30 years now. And as I hear these interviews and I contemplate the substance and the weight of this issue of eternal life or eternal condemnation, I am nervous. I am concerned because I know what the Lord is speaking to this generation is to draw near to God, to start making this a reality. Some of us have so much um, information that we just, you know, just shut down. Uh, uh, paralysis, uh, pa paralyzed by analysis, paralysis by analysis. It's so much information. We'd rather say, you know some pastor, don't bring the extent and weight of this issue upon my life. And I have to, because I believe, the next verse says, verse 38, in that day, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage, not concerned with God, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Uh, verse 39, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So in that regards, to get right with God is my utmost priority in life not just one time 30 years ago but each day seeking God's face seeking God's mercy seeking God's direction his word to my life to my family Hebrews 11 3 says that walking in a relationship with God Noah by faith Noah let's find that that verse there um I'm not sure if it's, there it is, verse 7. It's by this relationship with God, by faith, 
Noah was divinely, God warned of the things that were yet not seen, he moved. He began to gravitate in the direction, move with godly fear, preparing an ark for the saving of his family. Um, and this act condemned the whole world. He acted in a way to listen to what God was instructing. I believe each one of us must move in the direction of being right with God. The word that I've come to in this regard is called surrender. There's a lot of reasons why a lot of people in Noah's days did not listen to the warnings and move in the direction of God's salvation. But Noah and his family were saved, the Bible says. Genesis 7, 16 says, Every male and female of the animals, those that entered, male and female, all flesh went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut the door. So there was people inside the provision of God, and there were people outside the provision of God. The question this morning is, you, not a commentary on this movie, but an opportunity to begin to figure out why we can't surrender, why we're so overwhelmed with other matters that we should be found outside of this provision. God has given us instruction in Genesis 6, 14, and 15. This is how you're to build. Make yourself this ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it outside with pitch. Verse 15. And this is how you shall make it. How many know that God is being faithful and in instructing us this morning? That, that, you know, we're to really forget about Hollywood. Forget about the majority of the people in this film that are being interviewed, knowing to do the right thing, have chosen to walk contrary the fear of God and the concerning getting prepared. We must move in this direction. This man, Noah, was so powerfully moved in that direction that he saved his wife, his three sons, and their wives. But the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, that in the last days, people will make fun according to their own lust. Everybody's pursuing other things, serving other things, other priorities, making other things their, their, um, their responsibility and trust and care in this life. Forgetting, verse 5 says, they deliberately put out of mind. They willfully forget that the word of God of old was destroyed through water. And in that forgetting, the Bible says, now that we remember, verse 14, how looking forward to these things. How many are looking forward to the fact that God says what's going to happen and it's going to take place like in the days of Noah? There's going to be people saved, prepared, fear of God, their sons, their their their. Uh, daughter-in-laws, they're all going to be in God's provision. Uh, looking forward to these things, we want to be diligently found by Him in peace without distortion. Verse 17. What lives, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand. How many, thank God, we got the game plan, right? God has laid it out for us. Nobody's confused. Nobody is, is, is missing out on being told. Be concerned lest you fall. Since you know this beforehand, beware that you fall away in the error of the wicked. Verse 18. Grow in your relationship, in the knowledge of Christ. And, and so this morning I asked the musicians to come forward, the worship team. And, and all I, my responsibility is this morning is to say, church, let's get right with God. Let's surrender and be known as righteous through the merits of Christ and his provision on the cross. Come to accounts with him. Surrender. I don't, I don't know what's keeping you from surrendering. There is no greater 
motivation and inspiration to be living like Noah was living in his time. I want to finish with Psalm 37, verse 7. It says, surrender to the Lord. And see these things patiently. Surrender in the Lord and wait on these things patiently. Do not see other people involved in other things and be concerned about their prosperity. Because the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Verse 9 says, all of a sudden, evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the provisions that he has for us. Let's stand this morning. And, and I pray that the Spirit of the Lord would lead you carefully, intentionally, willfully, not to forget, not to postpone, not to put away the seriousness of this matter, but to intentionally and purposely surrender to God. And, and that is, um, I, was, I was reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Listen, listen how this one chapter in the Bible goes from newborn babes. There's people that are new here. Maybe it's your first time to come to church. Maybe you've only been coming recently. So this, there's newborn babies that are they're struggling for, for growing up. And, mean, and from this verse to I believe it's verse 5 maybe. Let's go to 5. Yeah. Look from a newborn baby that drinks milk to this. Building up your spiritual house to offer up a life that is acceptable to God. Isn't that powerful? That just in a few verses, you go from being a baby to being responsible. That my life is an expression of pleasing God in an acceptable manner. Now, I, want, I want to be purposeful in my life. To live not crazy, saying I'm a Christian, sleeping around, living without regards to the fear of God, walking into places where wicked people walk into. I remember about five years ago, we went to Arizona and we were 10 minutes away from Las Vegas. We could see the lights of the city in the middle of the desert. And my kids had heard that a lot of their friends and family members had gone to Las Vegas and they said, Dad, we want to see Las Vegas. I said, listen, we're going to go to heaven knowing we did not go to Sin City. We're going to have that as our legacy to our family that wherever sin is, we're walking and running the opposite direction. It would have been easy to go up there and just see the city and, and they've made it a family-friendly environment with whores and prostitutes and gambling but guess what the righteous are getting prepared to be found right not because we're perfect not because we're holier than thou but because we have to be intentional and wherever sin is we're not and wherever sin is in our life we're coming before God saying wash me with the blood of Jesus I confess my sins I come with you, Lord, you know my sin already. And so this morning, I, I pray that you would just raise one hand and say, Lord, I want to surrender fully and be ready at your coming. I want my family to be ready to take, take God serious and prepare an ark of salvation. That we would follow your commands and instruction so that we not suffer what the wicked will suffer in these coming days the red moons, the blood moons, whatever the case may be, the wars and rumors of wars, man doing whatever he wants. The Bible says in, in Genesis chapter 6 that the thought, every thought of man was towards wickedness. We're, th we're seeing here in Miami the Ultra Fest where, where thousands gather in debauchery and godless behavior, not fearing God. And God always has a remnant. Father, look at the hands that have been raised.